The GPU folks might disagree, but instruction set architectures have been mostly stable and pretty boring for a while. Um, as a result, single thread performance has been mostly dependent on the people in the fabs, um, and some uh, admittedly fairly interesting things done at the microarchitecture level, but instruction sets, instruction set models haven't changed. Um, and the emphasis has moved to multiprocessing, which 20 years ago was always derided as when you run out of ideas, multiprocessing, um, for better or worse. That's the dominant thing today. Uh, today's talk is about some aspects of a rather different instruction execution scheme. Previous talks have been about encoding and memory access. So if you want to learn more, please see the AA380 talks last year and uh, I guess they're both last year. And the out of the box computing website has some talks that we didn't get for some reason. <laughs> oh well. Um, Ivan Goddard, out of the box computing. And I thank you. Today's talk is about certain aspects of the execution model used by the Mill architecture. The Mill is a family of CPU designs, um, family in the sense of the 360. A, due to the advances in the architecture, the, it's a commercial product, or we hope it will be, it's still in development, and it offers a 10x power performance advantage over existing architectures. This is an architectural advance. It is not a circuit advance. It is not a fab advance. We use exactly the same um, run of the fab um, circuits and standard rules as anybody else. It is an architectural advantage. It does so without requiring a rewrite of your program. It does so without requiring multiple core or multi-programming. Um, you uh, can, of course, multi-core and multi-program mills just like anything else, and it's just as much a pain in the butt on a mill as it is on anybody else. This particular talk, I have to back up a little bit and speak a little bit to describe the way data is moved back and forth internally in the machine. The mill has no general registers. It uses a different device, and I have to explain that a bit. This was actually covered in considerably greater depth um, roughly a year ago, um, May or thereabouts here, um, and the complete talk of that is both available on the, three, uh, the 380 website and on ours. And much greater detail at other locations. Um, f given that as a background, I'll talk a bit about how phasing permits us to triple the effective ILP, instruction level parallelism, of existing codes, um, how we are able to combine the computational capacity of the machine so as to support novel um, operations that a conventional machine cannot do. Um, and how that gets uh, used in order to avoid the problems using condition codes um, to indicate Boolean values. Um, lastly, I'll speak briefly on the subject of how n-way branching is performed and how uh, when you have multiple calls in a single instruction, how these cascade. This is a series of talks. This is the sixth of them. All the prior talks videos are available on our website at that address. Those of you who are taking the class for credit, um, your homework assignment is to review the material at that location. There will be a test. And a caution. This talk is a gross oversimplification. The guts inside a CPU are fiendishly complicated and depend on hardware and other details that cannot be covered in a talk of this nature. Instead, I try to convey an intuitive understanding uh, suitable for a non-specialist. You're assumed to have some idea what goes on in your CPU, but uh, we're not going to get in any great detail. I'm open to questions after the talk, and I can go into all the detail you'll ever want, but the talk itself doesn't do that. Reality is much more complicated than this talk will indicate. We try not to oversimplify, but sometimes. So a few words on the belt. 
As I said, the machine has got no general registers, but it, you do have to get the result from one ad into the, uh, the multiply that you have to use the next uh, data with, and that requires a communication device. The mill is the first of a new category of, of processors called a belt machine. There are numerous other categories. There are stack machines and accumulator machines and general register machines and so forth. These are categories. There's lots of different architectures within a category. There's lots of possible belt machines. The mill is one. It is a point in that design space. Um, the communication device looks like a conveyor belt. It is a fixed length FIFO. Assume that that is a set of values sitting on the belt. A functional unit can read any position in that FIFO, pulling values off it down into the functional unit. New results always drop on the front of the belt unconditionally. You do not specify a destination for your computation. However, it's a fixed length, so when you drop a new one on the front, well, that pushes the oldest off the back, and it is gone permanently. The functional units, there, there are many. The mill is a wide issue machine in the sense that a single instruction can contain many operations like, like a VLIW does. Um, f fair warning, a terminological trap here. Most people are used to thinking that an ad is an instruction. Once you're in the wide issue world, an ad is not an instruction. An ad is an operation, and there may be a ton of, of other operations in the same instruction. So in this case, you can have three different functional units, which will be independently grabbing values off of the belt. And in due course, when those functional units are ready to retire an A result, all of their results drop onto the front of the belt and push corresponding numbers of operations off the back. Addressing into the belt is addressed by relative position. So this, for example, might be an assembly language operation. This is add B3, belt position 3, do belt position 5. Note no destination. The results are implicitly dropped on the front. The B3 and B5 are there. If you think about it, you realize that B3 is the fourth most recent value to have dropped to the belt. And B5 is the sixth most recent value to have dropped to the belt. So this is temporal addressing. It is not spatial addressing. You're not saying put something in R6 and it stays in R6. This says pick up the value indicated by the temporal order in which it got originally placed upon the belt. So a consequence of this is that every time you do a new drop on the front, everybody's temporal address changes. So that, for example, if we want to reference that value 8 in red there, um, that is B3 now. But as soon as a few more values drop onto the belt, B3 now refers to somebody else, and that value 8 is now B6. This is a truly awful process to attempt to keep track of by hand. The mill is not designed to be an assembly language target. However, this is trivial for a compiler to keep track of, and it, uh, it is no more difficult than the problems involved in, for example, um, register coloring and similar things for a compiler. Now, so much for the belt. Talking about, going to talk about phasing. Operations connect through data flow paths such that the result of one operation is the input to a next. And the chain of such items is a data flow, frequently a data tree, but uh, for most of what I can show on a slide, you can only fit so much on a slide. Um, we're going to be looking at linear data flows rather than trees. A consequence of the way the mill is organized is that we are, in fact, able to execute faster than, it, than the clock rate would appear to make possible. I want to emphasize that this is a programming model. The underlying reality does not have a time tunnel inside it. There is no black hole and a spinning black hole that permits you to um, do multiple things at once. 
Um, so I will be explaining a little bit about how the hardware provides a solution, but from the viewpoint of the running program, effectively we get a significant speed up and you'll see how. Now, a data flow is a chain of operations which are dependencies. If there is no gap, such that the add goes directly to the multiplier, goes directly to the subtract unit, goes directly to the store unit with no time gaps at all, the fastest speed determ is determined by the latency of the individual operations. An add takes one cycle, a multiply takes three cycles, um, the subtract takes one cycle. Well, you know that the fastest you're going to get is it's going to take five cycles to get through all of that because it's immediate one after another. This limit based on the propagation delay of the data which has to be passed through is analogous to what happens in um, the, the propagation of sound in um, a medium like air. Because the speed of sound is determined by how fast one molecule can juggle up to the next molecule can juggle up to the next molecule. And that's determined by the characteristics of the medium. But uh, there is an upper limit to it, which is identified in aeronautics as a Mach number after Ernst Mach. Um, and Mach number one is the speed of sound. And by analogy, Mach number one is the speed that a computer can execute a data flow with no gaps in the middle, just one thing going directly to the next, to the next, to the next. You might think that Mach 1 cannot be exceeded. And in fact, I'm here to show you that it can be, just in fact as you can do it in airplanes. Now, for example, let's take this as a little piece of source code. We've got a big constant there that's much too big to be done as an immediate and an add operation. Um, I'm assuming a load store architecture here, not uh, something in which, um, like an x86, where you have uh, uh, funny extensions and huge instructions that can carry big constants. But think of your typical risk type instruction set. And the machine code of this is, well, you're going to have to have some kind of an operation that builds a constant for you. Sometimes in some machines this is more than one operation in order to put it up in pieces. Other times there's some other way to do it. I'll assume the presence of a constant type operation. There's a functional unit that produces a constant. Then that has to be fed into an add, like that. And that, in turn, will have to be crossing a cycle boundary because we had to first get the const, and then one cycle later the data value is available to the adder. And now, once the adder's done its thing, that's going to be feed into a store unit, and there'll be another cycle boundary there. The dotted pink line in all of these slides means a cycle boundary. Anytime you see something flowing across there, um, it took an extra cycle. Now, that's the basic model. In a VLIW, which is a, a wide issue machine, you can issue several operations in parallel. In fact, you might be able to have a constant and add and a store all in one instruction, which is a fairly typical arrangement for VLIWs. So if that's our same source code, the machine code might look like this, where an underscore there means all one instruction. So this is one instruction with three operations in it. We might think that, well, you can have a const, feeding to an add, feeding to a store. But, unfortunately, you can't do that. The whole cycle is taken up by the const, and the whole cycle is taken up by the add, and arrows don't go upwards in data flow. They only go downwards. So anytime you see an arrow going upward, that means that this is something that is physically impossible. Those paths are impossible. So, what do you do? The VLIW is going to have to take three cycles, just like a risk would have to take three cycles. The mill splits each instruction cycle into phases. These are not subclocks. We don't actually have a whole bunch of, of little clocks inside the big clock. There's only one big clock. Um, so, phasing is a conceptual model. That source code, again, 
will produce, in fact, the same um, machine code as the VLIW uses. Constant add and store, all in one instruction. The underline recall means that this is in one instruction. There's our cycle boundaries. The const unit happens there. That feeds the add because operations in different phases can be part of the same data flow. There is a phase boundary between the two, but not a cycle boundary. And there's a phase boundary between the add and the store. Now, this is the logical view. Physical reality is different. That's, I used to say that when I was in the 60s. But. Anyway, phases execute in sequence as a data flow. And each operation in the instruction set of the machine is associated by definition to one particular phase. The results of an op, that each operation can have as its input, results from a prior phase. Here are your phases. The reader phase handles those things which have no inputs, constants, values read from spec, from spec regs for, from the scratch pad. Scratch pad we won't address, but it's temporary storage area. Op phase is all your ordinary ops, your adds and subtracts and your loads and your thises and that, uh, that's. So op, anything in op phase can see, a, see anything that was produced in reader phase. In particular, in our example here, add can see the result of const. Call phase, function calls. Pick is a uh, the equivalent to the uh, question mark colon operator in, uh, in C, it selects one of two based on a selector value, has a phase all of its own, and writer phase are those things which are pure sinks and who accept uh, inputs but have no output, in particular stores, branches, and things like that. So those are your basic phases. Our const add and store, which we had in our example code, the const is in reader phase, so it can pass data to the add, which is in op phase. And the add can pass data from op phase to writer phase. If the phases happen to be the same, you can't pass through, but you can pass to a subsequent phase in the phase order list that I just described. In the actual implementation, one ops from one instruction are not issued altogether the way they would be in a VLIW. That VLIW, if it said const add store, all of those are happening all at once in the same cycle. That's what a VLIW does, it's what it is. Not true in a mill. Instead, the ops from a single uh, instruction are in fact issued over three different cycles. So, if these are my three instructions, in this cycle, this is instruction one, instruction two, instruction three in order in the program. In this cycle, the reader phase uh, will f of instruction one will be the first thing that happens. Then we cross the cycle boundary. And instruction one's op phase executes at the same time as the reader phase of instruction two. Another cycle boundary. Instruction one is reached and is executing writer phase. Instruction two is now in its op phase doing ads and the like. And instruction three has just started up with whatever it's got for reader phase. And so on in the obvious way. So each instruction executes over three cycles, which are one cycle phased away from the, um, the prior and subsequent instruction. Now, one way of looking at this is that the phases form an intra-instruction software pipeline. 
Values get passed from one to the next over multiple cycles, but still within one instruction in the way that a software pipeline loop does. It's an analogy. It can't be pushed too far, but it's a way of thinking about it. Now, phase assignments. I alluded to this. Those things which are going to be operations which will be assigned to reader phase will be all those that don't need any inputs. They can just be done as soon as they get decoded. Op phase are those things which need to have some inputs and also produce results that somebody's going to want to produce, uh, want to consume. And writer phase are pure saints, things which will um, uh, grab values but do not have to pass them to anybody else. There are cycle boundaries between these, and as a result, each phase can, in fact, pass to the subsequent phase, even though they are in the same instruction, because they issue at different times. How that works with a decode, on most machines, in particular most VLIWs and other wide issues, all of the operations of a single instruction are decoded simultaneously, and they're all made available to the execution unit simultaneously. Not on the mill. The mill is way too wide for that. Um, the mill is exceptionally wide. At the high end mill family uh, of the mills, you can have 30 or more operations in a single instruction, um, all of which have to be, be decoded out of a variable length encoding. And there's a complete video and talk on that subject at uh, considerable length on the site. Remember, that's your homework. Those instructions wind up being pulled up through a fetch hierarchy and placed in a microcache, which is the actual input into the decoder. So the instruction gets sent to a decoder, and that takes uh, it's crossing a cycle boundary as it goes from, from the microcache into the decoder. Internally, in order to decode 30 plus operations, it takes the decoder three full cycles to be able to do that. And how it gets away with being able to do it in only three cycles is um, an interesting subject that you can read about elsewhere. Meanwhile, different parts of the instruction are available from the decoder in different cycles. Some parts are available in the very first cycle. Some parts take two cycles. Some parts take three cycles to get everything figured out. So as each piece comes out of, uh, out of the uh, three different cycles in decode, they get fed to the execute engine. And the execute engine then winds up, um, uh, dear mate, um, two of the blocks are available a cycle before the others out of the six blocks which incur in an instruction. And they are arranged so that those things which are going to want to execute in reader phase, in fact, are in the part of the instruction which is decoded first and is available immediately. So if that's our instruction coming in, one cycle later, the reader ops can go be sent directly over to the execute. That constitutes the reader phase as far as the execution is concerned. Meanwhile, the partly decoded instruction is sent to the second stage in the decoder and gets decoded there. And the ops resulting from that decode gets sent over to the execute engine. And the instruction moves to yet the third stage of the decoder where the writer ones are decoded and sent over. So, the, the three cycles of execute directly correspond to the three cycles of the decode. As fast as things come out of the decode, even though it is all one instruction, it's that decode is stretched over three cycles, and correspondingly, the execution is also stretched over three cycles. The decoders are fully pipelined, and so as a result, you can initiate the decode of a new instruction every cycle. There's our first instruction going in. It goes, produces a reader result and moves down, but meanwhile the next instruction gets pulled in. And its partial decodes move over to execution, and yet another instruction gets pulled in. And this becomes your steady state. At least if not interrupt by a branch misprediction, which is the bane of everybody. 
The phases up, uh, of uh, instruction decode overlap with the phases of the adjacent instructions. Reader phase happens in the same cycle as the op phase of the prior instruction and the writer phase of the instruction before that. Now, so much for the arrangement. How about those other phases? I only mentioned three, but the phase listed several other phases. Well, pick phase, which is used by the pick operation, which is the question mark colon uh, primitive of C, um, doesn't actually use a functional unit. It's not like an add, which has an adder. Instead, pick actually is implemented in the data distribution network, the crossbar, which communicates data across a cycle boundary from one, from one cycle to the next. And actually, it occupies zero time at all, although the slide is showing that as if there was a PIC functional unit, there really isn't. It's sort of actually happening as the cycle boundary happens and data is getting routed. So it doesn't occupy a functional unit, and we don't have to occupy a whole cycle for a PIC. We can simply slip a PIC in between an equal and a store. Call phase used only by the call operation. Function calls occur, function calls within an instruction occur after any prior phase of the same instruction. And the remaining phases of that instruction are executed after the call returns. That is what happens when you have a call is that the front half of the instruction is executed, then you do the call, and then the return comes back and you do the back half of the same instruction. If this is your source code, the machine code will look like that. Remember the underscore means this is all one instruction. It's an add, a call, or a store. The add feeds that you'd think would be um, by feeding some functional unit, uh, what actually that function is, is in the called function. So that the result of the add is being passed directly into the call E with only just the cycle boundary in between. <coughs> the call E will execute some amount. The double pink line there means some unknown number of cycles, whatever um, that function does. And eventually it'll execute a return. It will then exit, crossing a cycle boundary, and we're back in the original one, directly able to store the result of the function call. It's re-executed, but without the operations that have already been done. Well, what happens if you have more than one call? That works in ML. Multiple calls are executed consecutively in an order defined by the encoding order. And the returns from one call return directly into the next called function, not back to the original instruction. So if there's a piece of code where we have nested calls, the machine code will be add call call store. And the add will feed G, which will run some number of operations in function G. That will return not back to the instruction containing the add, but directly into F, which will do some amount of work, which will eventually, the last guy in the cascade, will eventually return that value to the final store. Those of you who are familiar with the term will recognize that this is tail calls and the mill does tail calls in hardware for free. That is a direct transfer, assuming, again, you didn't have a mispredict, which you would not have in this case. Now, that explains what the mechanism is, but what's the benefit? There have been a ton of papers and studies and vast quantities of academic arguing over exactly how much instruction level parallelism is inherent in existing programs. 
Many of these papers wind up, if you look at them very closely, that all they're doing is measuring their compiler or measuring their uh, measurement methodology. But over time, for general purpose code, and we're not talking embedded, we're not talking um, to, uh, oh, uh, the kinds of things that a GPU does, but for general purpose code, the consensus is, is that the operation level parallelism, that is the number of operations which do not have dependencies and in principle could be executed together, is in the order of two or three, on the average. Well, it turns out that's false. In particular, out-of-order machines um, avoid it, but so does the mill. Say we have two data flows. These are, again, very simple for illustration. On a conventional machine, you could do the two cons in parallel. A cycle later, you could do the add and the subtract in parallel because there's no, nothing else which is not have a data dependency. A cycle later, you can do the two stores in parallel. Sure enough, operation level parallelism of two. And it takes three cycles to do it. On a mill, they all go in one cycle. And the operation level parallelism is six. Why? Because the con, the add, and the store can all be done in one instruction on the mill, and because the mill is very wide, it has no problem at all doing six, a, a six-wide instruction. So we have effectively trebled our operation level parallelism. We call it Mach 3. Where the gain comes about, if what you have is a very long basic block and you're concerned about operations in the middle of the basic block, the mill's phasing offers no advantage over a conventional VLIW. Why? Assume that we're in the middle of a basic block and it's got some number of operations. With mill phasing, we would encode it this way. Note that the con will, in fact, wind up being executed there, and the store will wind up being executed there, but it's still one instruction as far as uh, the code is concerned. On a VLIW, you can simply put the con and the store in the appropriate place. The mill has not gotten any faster than what the VLIW would have done. This, however, is true only in the middle of a long basic block. If you are not in that circumstance, when you're adjacent to control flow, phasing does uh, earn cycles over a conventional AIW. If, for example, the basic code is there's a branch, and say it's an if-then-else, and the then part is doing our con-add store and then doing another branch to someplace else, well then, Mill phasing will move the con up there, and that is true only if that branch is taken. If the circular, circular the encircled branch is in fact taken, because only then does that instruction in the then part actually happen, and only then does the con wind up actually having already executed in parallel with the branch. Similarly, the store in mill phasing will have be a one cycle later, but even though there is a branch there, the exit branch, that store will be executed whether that branch is taken or not. In effect, mill phases get moved over control flow. On a VLIW without phasing, you can't do that. The only way you can get the con to be executed only if taken on a VLIW if it's in an instruction after the branch. The only way you can get that store done on a taken or not basis is if the branch which does the exit is after the store. 
the VLIW scheduler cannot hoist the con over the branch or lower the store over the branch because if it hoisted the con over the branch then the con would be executed whether or not the branch was taken and that's not going to be semantically what the program asked for and if it lowers the store over the branch it will uh, wind up only uh, executing the store if the branch went one way rather than go going the other way um, so fundamentally a VLIW is stuck and cannot do this kind of mechanism Phasing, in some ways, is like out of order. It approximates data flow. A true data flow machine, those of you who are interested in history can look up the Manchester MU5 and find out what a, a real data flow machine uh, might be. But no machine can be fundamentally faster than a data flow architecture. It's simply architecturally, well, mathematically impossible. Unfortunately, a true data flow architecture requires unbounded hardware, and that's rather difficult to fit on a chip. Consequently, all machines attempt to approximate what a data flow architecture does. And out of order does do that. It rec dynamically detects the presence of a data flow in the instruction stream, and then schedules things in data flow order with maximum overlap. That's what your Haswells and so forth that do out of order do internally. Phasing, in many ways, can be thought of as being a statically scheduled out of order. The compiler knows where the data flow. The compiler doesn't have to go and figure it out in hardware the way an out of order machine does. And the compiler can simply schedule the operations such that the data flow that the operations represent properly overlaps with the data flows being scheduled by other instructions. The phasing device, because it doesn't have any bit of benefit over VLIW in long codes, in the middle of long codes, it benefits you only when you're adjacent to control flow. However, control flow is exceptionally frequent. On the average, every six to 10 operations or thereabouts. Guess what? One mill instruction is quite happy with six to 10 or operations. So one of the characteristics you see in mill code is that basic blocks tend to be one instruction long, the whole thing, no matter how much work it's doing. OOO, out of order, beats phasing when the actual dependencies of the data flow are not in the phase order. The phase order is fixed on a mill. You can't change it. So, for example, um, a function call whose argument is an add is one, uh, one cycle on a mill. But an add, one of whose arguments is a function call, has to be two, because the call phase is after the op phase. An OOO, which is dynamically detecting this and dynamically scheduling, can do a better job in that case. Turns out, well, we've done our best to order the phases in such a way that this kind of thing doesn't happen very much, and we've been reasonably successful. We're, the performance is a rough approximation to what no old machine will do. Phasing be out of order when the out of order machine is issue limited. The mill is very, very wide. And out-of-order machines are hitting hardware limits, which preclude having an issue with some more than about eight. Haswell, I think, is eight, for example. So if you want to be able to put together um, uh, data flows, which uh, together would be a dozen operations, you're issue limited. You can't do that on, a, on an out-of-order machine. And furthermore, you're not going to be able to do it on any out-of-order machine because out-of-order hardware is extraordinarily complex, extraordinarily large, and extraordinarily power-hungry. And you've just hit diminishing returns, and even eight is pushing it. Um, MIL does not have these constraints. It is extremely power stingy, and it puts its area into functional units which are tiny. So the mill does not have constraints that make it issue limited, or at least family members don't. So phasing is an example of something that um, 
uh, of which we've had other examples in ver addressed in various talks. Uh, one of those in the discussions of, me of the memory system of memory introduced a notion called a deferred load that I won't go into, but remember your homework. Um, and its consequence of a deferred load is that we can approximate the performance of an out-of-order machine without the power and area overhead of actually doing a real out-of-order. This is another example. You will, we will rarely, well, depends on the complexity of the code, but we will not often actually beat an out-of-order machine, but we'll be in, we will be roughly at a par in terms of total throughput. Um, and the saving is in the power and the area. Now, so much for ganging, and which is the attachment of operations temporally. In addition, we need to address um, the possibility of combining operations um, um, horizontally, not temporally, but spatially. That also exists on the mill, and it's called ganging. It removes a source count limitation, which is present on essentially all machines. Architectures are designed in order to have a, um, to optimize the common case, and the common case is that um, you have operations that are two input and one output, like an add. And consequently, there are data paths to feed functional units, which carry two data in and one data out. So nearly everything has that kind of a structure. Bear in mind, we're using the belt, so the value data is coming in from the belt, and um, uh, but it's two in, and the adder takes it takes in two inputs and produces one result, which goes back out. The operations are encoded. The act the bit layout of the encoding is designed to support this. The data paths are designed to support this, and essentially all machines do this. Us too. Unfortunately, there are operations that are exceptions to the two in and one out rule. One of them is fuse multiply add. It has three inputs and computes A times B plus C. Well, you might think you could do that. In fact, adding a third input into the encoding and into the data paths to the functional pipelines would be really expensive and fundamentally you don't want to do it. Every machine has to, that supports FMA has to deal with this and um, the contortions that it uses are extreme. Um, if you want to get into the details, feel free. The mill doesn't do it quite that way. Instead, we define what we call a gang. These are two or more adjacent two input data paths that cooperatively implement a single operation. Those are two, two inputs. Each of the execution pipelines has a perfectly normal two input, one out, well, no outputs, two input, zero output on the mill um, uh, encoding slot. And each contains perfectly ordinary two input data paths uh, suitable for functional units like ALUs and FPUs and so forth. When what you want to do is a three input, those slots cooperatively implement a single operation by defining another operation whose name internally is called args that has inputs but no results. Well, we now have two inputs going down one path and one input going down another path, but what we really want was three inputs. So args passes its data horizontally between the functional units. That in turn produces a result in a perfectly ordinary way. Ganging is used for all operations that have got more than two inputs. However, just having an args op which does nothing except uh, take in an input for the data pass and pass it along horizontally seems somewhat wasteful. It would be nice if you could do something else besides having the FMA there. So what's really going on? Well, internally to the FMA functional unit, 
there's a multiplier, and the two inputs get multiplied. Then the args value comes in, and the result of the multiply and the result of the value coming from the args gets passed to an adder, which is also in that same functional unit, like so. But we could put something, do something useful in the second slot. So let's gang together two FMA units to make what we call FMAS, or Fuse, Multiply, Add, Subtract, with four inputs. The two units, the two pairs of units each go to the multiplier. The result of the two multiplies are horizontally interchanged. And then one side does an add, and the other side does a subtract. The result is two results. Mill is very good at multiple results because of the belt structure, which computes the sum and difference of two products. Sometimes you only want one, you ignore the, the second, or you uh, sometimes want both for many kinds of floating point computations. It happens to like having both of those. Yes? I'm, I'm somewhat deaf, and I'm going to need someone to repeat the question. Is that an FFT butterfly in that? Um, fancy that. <laughs> um, in any case, sum and difference of two products, making use of the functional units that are already there. Now, alternatively, you could use that same hardware, there's two multipliers and two adders, to do two FMAs. Here we need six inputs. Okay. We're now going to get two individual FMA operations. Uh, FMAS, like FMA, has only one rounding error. And is consequently is advantageous over the equivalent simple multiply add sequence. Now, ganging, as I said, is used for any time you need more than two inputs, but it actually has other uses as well, and I'm going to touch on one of those, which we call predicate gangs. Let me introduce you to the bane of CPU design. It's called a condition code. Condition codes are side effect byproducts of ALU operations where bits are set typically in the program status word that indicate whether the add you just did had a result that was zero, greater than zero, less than or zero, had a carry coming out of it, overflowed, or what have you. The problem is, is that this is a global state. It's real nice. You can do a subtract and get the subtract result, and in addition, immediately branch on whether the, the, um, you would gotten to zero, for example. The, the condition codes were designed to support decremental looping. Um, but uh, the next operation that comes along that uses the condition codes just clobbered your condition codes. And when you are doing a whole bunch of operations in parallel, all of whom set the condition codes, well, who wins? Who does set them? And so condition codes are never used in wide issue machines. In an out of order machine, condition codes have to be renamed because of the problem that they will get cluttered. The add and subtract are not necessarily done in the order that they look like. And you have to have multiple copies of the condition codes that moved around like multiple copies of the registers. And it's part of the um, extremely complicated and power-hungry part of making an out-of-order machine work. Um, all of the people who actually have to do things like x86, modern x86 chips do dearly wish the condition codes had gotten left out of the original architecture, but the original architecture had, did not have that much of a view of the future. On the other hand, condition codes will speed up some kinds of code. But they can't be speculated because it's a global state. The mill is very big on speculation, making use of all of its width. Um, you just need to be able to collect the predicate metadata of was this greater than or less than zero or what have you, and um, save it somewhere. 
where somebody can use it without actually saving it globally. So say that's our source code, and this is the typical bottom, bottom of accounting loop, and are we at the end of the loop um, uh, piece of code. Or we decrement i, and if it's greater than zero, we will go to the top of the loop or do something. In machine code, if there are no condition codes, you have to do a subtract on the i to, to decrement it. And then, then you separately do a greater than zero on the result. And then you branch of that greater return true. True in this case being a data value rather than a condition code. With condition codes, the subtract sets the greater than um, uh, condition code, and the branch can simply branch on that condition right away. We've saved a cycle. That's why condition codes exist. The problem, of course, is that many, many operations set the codes, but they're rather rarely looked at, typically only by an, a branch immediately following them. The condition codes are almost always immediately consumed and are never cared about anymore, but somebody has to keep track of them in the hardware. And they can't be speculated because it's global state. So down with condition codes, in the words of Edska Dijkstra, condition codes considered harmful. So what you really want is to be able to speculate them. Well, the mill code, we need subtract and greater than branch on true. That is, in fact, one instruction. We want a data flow that goes from subtract to greater to branch on true. But subtract and greater than are both op phase operations. Consequently, that's a no-no, and you can't do that. Instead, it would require this code. We at least get the greater and the branch done in, in parallel due to phasing. But um, we're still not much better off than what a, 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 your typical risk machine would be. One possibility would be to have the subtract produce two results, or at least some flavor of uh, subtract to produce two results, both the numeric result of the subtract and also a flag saying it was greater. Well, we could define such an operation, let's call it subtract greater, that returns both the difference and a Boolean. That's two different results. That works. It would look like that. Now we're just in one instruction. It's op phase and rudder phase. Everybody's happy. Except you wind up with a huge opcode explosion because for everything that might produce a, uh, a, a, a condition code like result, you will now have to have flavors that produce each of the individual possible conditions. And your opcode space, the bit space in, in your encoding, uh, winds up getting rather nastily cluttered with stuff like that. Um, the, an implementation of this would require the addition of another fast path in the actual encoding. Uh, the actual mechanism passes data back and forth. That has clock impact. Don't worry about the details. That gentleman up there next to the camera can explain all about it, um, but uh, he's the, the hardware guy of, uh, that can do so. Uh, but fundamentally, um, there's good hardware reasons why you don't want to do this. So, that isn't going to work. Solution. We gang a predicate. The ALUs unconditionally and always provide what would be a condition code set horizontally to the adjacent slot. Then we define one operation, greater code, which reads the greater bit and returns it as a bool. This is our source code. That is our mill code. The underscore means it's all one instruction. That is a gang. 
it is not passing data through the normal data flow. It is passing data across between functional units within a cycle. And that data, in turn, can be passed to the branch due to phasing. The gang is op phase. The gang may be just thought of as being a two-slot super, super operation. There's just, ju just one operation, even though we had to break it apart into, into uh, two pieces. There's the two inputs to the sub. The grader has no inputs at all. The code gets passed from the sub to the grader horizontally. We go through the cycle boundary. The subtract result winds up every, where it uh, does, as does the greater result. But in addition, the branch on true can pick up that. It's all one instruction, and we're done. Phasing permits us to pick that up as being still in the same cycle. Consequently, because these are numeric predicates, they get dropped in the belt like any other, just as if we had a two-result operation, except that what we actually have is two different slots producing one result each, so we don't have fast pass problems, and we don't have uh, um, encoding explosion problems, and speculation is done. Now, there's some operations that while you'd like to be able to issue them in parallel, they cannot execute in parallel, and control flow are the most important of these. We want to be able to have a bunch of branches in one instruction, multi-way branches. The typical example being a switch or a case statement, depending on your favorite language, um, which tend to be truly annoying in hardware. Um, if that is our source code. The machine code will typically test for the first case and branch to a test for the next case and branch to a test for the next case and branch to it and so forth. If the cases are dense, sometimes you can load a dispatch table, a table of label variables, or a table of branch offsets, but that involves having to pull stuff out of memory and that's slow and well, there are a whole lot of solutions, none of them very satisfactory, that you'll find in architectures of various machines. Typically, however, most compilers today will turn this into a chain of individual if tests, um, though they will optimize certain <coughs> cases. The problems are is that the tests and branches execute sequentially. You're going to wind up with a prediction for each of those branches, and they tend to clutter the prediction tables. It's possible for the sequence to mispredict several times, because um, you, the, uh, the uh, predictions will uh, zoom down and say, oh, this must be case three, and will send the, the execution unit off to the corresponding case. It's discovered that this is wrong. We unwind everything, go and test the next case. And in the absence of three, it now predicts that five is going to be taken, and it turns out that five wasn't taken either. And the correct thing we should have done was go to the default case. But meanwhile, we've taken the two mispredicts, and mispredicts on a conventional machine are exceptionally painful. The mill only has a five cycle mispredict penalty as opposed to the 15 or 20 typical of other machines, but five cycles is painful for us too. So, what we do is we put all of the thing in one instruction. The equals feed only their respective branches. They can be done in parallel because there's no data connection between them. They're both up phase, but they both can be executed simultaneously. The data will flow to the two branches, which are both in writer phase. They don't have any um, data interconnection, so they can be executed in parallel. However, of course, only one of those should win. In this case, numerically, only one is possible, but indeed, other conditions, it could be that more than one uh, had its, its um, taken, untaken predicate true. We define a rule such that in encoding order, the first taken branch is taken, and if there are more, 
we don't care. So the first encoding, even though they're all executed, only one actually reroutes the core execution, the first one. There is only one prediction for the whole, for the whole switch. The mill predicts exits rather than branches, and that has been thoroughly covered in a talk called Prediction that you will find in your homework assignment. No more than one mispredict is possible. We, by the time we come back having discovered that we were wrong, we now have got the correct value and only, we will in fact take the correct branch. So, in brief summary, you can do intra-instruction data flow. If every phase is occupied, you can wind up having a substantial expansion. But in practice, codes do not contain um, every phase in a data flow. We find that a Mach 3 is reasonably representative. It is heavily dependent on the application and the nature of the code. And it's also dependent on the width of the particular family member. Low-end machines, uh, low-end mills do not have all that much width. And uh, there might be uh, implicitly a uh, parallelism available that we can't use because it's not enough functional units. At the high end, it tends to be not a problem. Single instructions are issued over three cycles. Effectively, what we have is pseudo out of order that operates, executes operations over control flow the way a hardware out of order does. We can have a, a instructions containing multiple calls, which means the data flows can have, contain multiple calls too. Cascaded calls are automatically tail called. Only the last one returns to the original instruction. There's n-way branching in one instruction, and the compiler and the hardware both know what's going to happen and schedule the code accordingly. We're not constrained by pipeline data paths because we can gang, assuming that the underlying functional capacity is there. Consequently, we can support novel operations which have m inputs and n outputs that other machines simply do not have including perhaps specialized operations for um, uh, certain particular market areas. And has speculable condition codes. So you get the performance gain on it without the global state. There, I will leave this slide up. There you can find additional documentation. The mailing list will get you on our mailing list for announcements of talks like this, which take place, sorry Andy, takes place elsewhere. Um, although you could sign us up for another one next semester if you wanted. Um, and there's announcements of things like the white paper availabilities and, and such like. I'm open to questions. We are in mid-patent filing, so we cannot expose a bunch of stuff. The things which I can talk about in these talks are things the patents have gone in, but to completely expose the, the, the machine, uh, we cannot yet do. That said, that doesn't matter because the compiler doesn't work. Um, we had a compiler which was based on the EDG front end, the one which goes into the Intel ICC compiler, and our own middle and back ends. And it was up to the point where it would generate code. Um, and we realized that this was completely wrong-headed. We do not want to roll our own, especially not all the middle end optimizations for vectorization, which is well-established technology, and there's just no point in us repeating it. Um, and so we made the decision to convert to, uh, discard our old one and convert to LLVM. 
That was at the point when the patent office uh, changed its rules and we realized we had to immediately, we had to come out of stealth and immediately sp uh, start filing patents. And frankly, I am so sick of patents because we have been doing nothing except file patents for the last year. And unfortunately, the LLVM effort has been set aside. We just recently added a new person to the team who's taking that on, and um, there will be some major work having to be done, even with LLVM, because LLVM makes some very rash assumptions. For example, it assumes it's running on a register machine, and we are not. Um, but we have, we have done enough work to know where at least some of the bodies are buried in LLVM or mill on the LLVM, um, but um, it, it's, it is definitely a major piece of work still to go. By the time, however, that work is done, all the patents will be in, we'll have benchmarks available and all the rest of everything else. So it doesn't really matter because we have two blocked things and they'll come out the back end roughly the same time we think. We hope. I, I'm, the, I'm a compiler guy. I've done 11 compilers, so um, <laughs> it's... Um, there's a lot of work in there, but we believe, in part because we already did one of the compi uh, compiler, we, we believe we understand what the issues will be, and our major difficulties will, in fact, be not with our stuff, but with LLVM, we think. More? Dave, can you come front and repeat? How many bell positions and how many loads and storage do you mean? Even right for. What do you mean? Load memory and storage memory. Load memory and storage memory. Load memory and storage memory. Oh, reading. Okay. It's a family. Like the 360 was a family. These parameters vary <laughs> by family member. The smallest one we have currently specified for configuration has a belt length of eight operands. The largest one we have is 32 operands. It's pretty clear that there's no point in anything smaller than 8. It's not clear that whether 64 would be useful, we believe not. You want to have the belt size to track the number of functional units because the number of functional units determines how many new values can drop each cycle. You have six adders, you could drop six add results. And you want to have enough belt so that those results get used before they fall off the end. So as you get more functional units, you also want to extend the belt to match. Um, this is purely a pragmatic sizing based on SIM. Again? So 32 belt, you have 32 registers in your belt and 90 some ports. Okay. These are not registers. Well, they're registers in the sense of a flip flop that has. Uh, there's not flip flops. E there's not flip flops either. The, the belt has been discussed in a prior talk, and with, without slides or whiteboard, it would be a bit to explain. It, the conceptual model of it being a colossal shift register is false. It doesn't actually work that way. There is no colossal shift register in the thing. Um, there are, it is not implemented as an SRAM array. It is not implemented as a, as a register file. Consequently, the, the notion of ports is not meaningful. Um, you go do the homework page and you'll, and you'll see how it works. The belt is essentially the bypass network that a conventional machine has. It's it's a, it's it's muck trees. Okay. The way the addressing happens is through a naming process. Um, when something which was formerly called B three becomes B five, all this changes the name. No data bits have moved. Time passed. Hmm? Time passed, which caused the name to change. Yeah. Yeah. So 
system with um, eight belt positions or 16 or 32 or whatever, um, the equivalent of object code that's running on the machine would have different size fields depending on... Oh, yes. Um, also, it seems that at some point things will fall off the end of the belt. And there will be cases where... That you still want them. Okay. Okay. Now, now I'll address both questions, and I could hear you. Um, I'm sorry, folks. I'm slightly deaf, and I, I need some help. Um, uh, with respect to things falling off the end, separately, there is a facility called the scratch pad. This is not memory. It is an operand store. It retains values in internal format, which is not the same as, as a memory format. And there are operations that say, this value on the belt, park it in the scratch pad. And later on, another operation that says, get it from the scratch pad and drop it on the belt. So values which need to be kept for long term, because their use is not yet coming up yet, or their last use is not yet coming up yet, wind up being explicitly moved to the scratch pad. The great majority of operands that are produced are immediately used once, and immediately to, uh, 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 they're immediately dead. Register death in, in, in a register machine is extremely high. There'll be a f some kind of case people will use a register as fast memory, but, but um, for things which are actually intermediate results, um, they tend to, if your compiler is doing a halfway decent job of uh, um, scheduling producers adjacent to consumers, um, their lifetime is very brief, and the great majority of them, if we've sized the belt appropriately, the great majority of them uh, will fall off the belt because they're past the, their last use. But for those that are, they get dropped in the scratch pad. And the other, oh, um, encoding. Not only does each family member have a unique binary encoding, but each encoding slot has a unique binary encoding. If this slot has got an ALU and an FPU, then it has to support both integer and floating point operations. And our software produces a binary encoding that encodes both integer and floating point operations. The adjacent slot, which has only got an ALU and not an FPU, has its own unique encoding that only contains the integer operations and not the floating point operations. These encodings are mechanically generated from a specification. Nobody does this by hand. Nobody lays out bits. The specification simply says, in this slot, there's this functional unit, and separately, that functional unit supports blah, 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 and blah. And the software, which has been running for years, this is long, stable software, um, proceeds to produce an entropy-optimal encoding with um, some special things so as to improve the life of the decoder beyond simple uh, optimal entropy. Um, and that's mechanically generated. And a trivial change, you've got a completely different binary encoding. The way you're able to handle um, the binary portability, which of course is important, is the same way that it's done in the, IM, uh, the IBM AS400 and its uh, descendants. And that is that what actually appears in your load module is a member independent representation of the program. And at install, or potentially load time if, it, if it's that late, or if you're building a ROM, a program which effectively is the last phase of the compiler, we call it the specializer, translates the member independent representation of the program to the actual bitsies for that member. That targeted member dependent representation is then cached in the load module. The next time you run it, we simply pull up that binary. But if you take the file off to another machine, the loader will look and say, oh, you don't have a cached uh, version of, of my machine. Runs a specializer, kind of like dynamic linking. It, 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 runs, it runs for you for free. Um, cache the new, the new one. And, you, and, and this is the equivalent of a strip tool, which remove excess cache ones that you don't want for, to save disk space and so forth. 
Okay? This is, uh, uh, we did not invent this mechanism. As I say, the AS400, uh, um, which is a huge product in the marketplace, and others have used the same approach. Can you talk a little bit about dynamic effects? If you have, uh, you showed loading a constant, but I assume if you get something from memory, if you had a cache fault or something, if you had a cache miss, would something have to stay on the belt for several cycles until the operand that missed in the cache came, say, to match up with the constant before it go ahead so the belt is a storage? The mill is a statically scheduled machine. Things are all arranged to work in lockstep. In this, it is like a VLIW. So how do you handle dynamic effects? The dynamic effects, if the value, we had to go to DRAM, and the value is not there when we need to drop it on the belt, we stall. And this is true just like a VLIW does. However, there are facilities which are covered in the memory talk that you'll find here called deferred loads which you are permitted to issue a load up there for its result to be delivered down here. And this will hide essentially all of your cache misses. It will not hide a DRAM miss, but everybody's going to take a DRAM miss. It's a situation where, again, we're as good as an OOO. We don't... We don't try and, and, and uh, get ahead of, of, of uh, you know, and, and have a super predicting cache. Okay? Yes? So, so and that's for me to make sure I understood what you said. So if you the compiler work more than you, then you should be able to figure out what the optimal belt is. The question is, is how, how would you schedule operations? I'll give you a quick rule of thumb in the way the operation scheduling works for us. This is fairly typical technology for a VLIW or other statically scheduled machine. The way you do it is in time reversed order. You take the final consumer, the return from a function call. You put that scheduled. I have a slot that can do a return. I put the return operation in it. What data is coming to it? Oh, well, a multiply is, is being, uh, what's being returned. A multiply takes three cycles. In a, a tableau, um, three cycles earlier, you put the multiply in in the first available position. Well, the multiplier has inputs, and slowly, and you build it up such that there is a minimal latency between producer and consumer. Um, Scheduling is the bin packing problem. It's NP complete. But uh, as a heuristic, this works very, very well. My question has to do with the size of the bill for your machine. I'm trying to say, is the compilers running through a bunch of programs be able to tell you what's the optimal size of the bill? Not that you will design it that way. The the compiler, the compiler cannot, uh, but um, the, uh, uh, repeated simulation can. Um, the, 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 that's uh, the belt size is not dynamic. It's it's it's, it's hard it's hardwired. Um, How sophisticated the compiler should be built. The, the, if. If what you want to do is, for example, size a chip purpose, a per, uh, purchase, well, you just get one of each of the available chips and, and, and compile your program for each and see how they do. Um, there's the, the, the compiler, well, the compiler actually, because the compiler's producing member independent code, does, assumes it has an infinite belt. Um, in, in the representation which is produced but goes for, to, to all. Don't switch the compiler. To the, 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 compiler ha the compiler does not know what the target member is. Only the specializer does. And it's the specializer who has to do the scheduling and deal with the saving and restoring out of scratch pad. Um, and, but this is no more, no more of a problem than saving and restoring registers in, uh, in a conventional register machine. And the algorithms look very similar. Is the um, number of simultaneous tests you can do in a multi-way branch dependent on which member of the family it is? It depends on how many branch units you have. 
And that, of course, is member so defense. specializer would have to then, um, conceivably, it's going to be breaking um, a multi-way but, branch differently. Indeed, and not shown is that we have um, de deferred branches, branch here, move there. Not, sh not shown in the slides. And that's uh, a, a major use of that. Um, this, is, this is not just the delay slots like an MIPS. Um, it's, it's, uh, this is uh, so, that log so that logical groups of, uh, of branches can, in fact, execute together, even, uh, even though there's not enough room to fit them all in, in, in one instruction. Well, it, it, that's the job that an out-of-order machine has to do, and it is a nightmare. Um, I, I, Nancy Reagan was right. Just say no. It's, it's, uh, we're statically scheduled. We don't have to worry about something being available. It will be available. It, it, it's not an issue of, of saving and restoring state. Um, the, I mean, yes, there's, there, there's state that has to be saved, for example, if you take an interrupt. Well, uh, um, and and may I re refer you to your homework? <laughs> the, the, the whole process of the way the belt cooperates across over calls is uh, about half of an hour talk on the on, on the belt subject. Feel free. Uh, it's not something I can do in real time here without a, without uh, slides. Others. Do you have support for atomicity in the machine, where you can say committed state versus speculative state, and, and deal with that on the track? Well, that's called metadata. And this is another talk, which is already on our slides. But the, that one I can ex explain a little bit. Attached to every operand and every element of a vector operand is one bit extra in the internal representation. This is called the NAR bit, or not a result. Um, this records whether there was a problem. When an exception happens, like an integer overflow, we, yes, we check. We don't throw a fault. What we do is we produce a result with an R-bit set. That, will that NAR value will flow through future computation um, until uh, perfectly ordinarily, but it the NAR bit will propagate it. An, an add with an R in reduces an R out. All speculative operations simply pass the thing through. Only if, the, if a value is being passed to a non-speculative operation, of which the important ones are store and conditional branch, because we don't know where to go, um, then and only then do we take a fall. So what actually happens for speculation, and the mill is designed to, to support high degrees of speculation because we've got the power budget to be able to do it. You enter the top of a branch, and we will more than happily put both halves of the branch in one instruction. No problem at all. Compute the whole thing. Eventually, when we figure out what we should have done, well, then we go to the code that uses whichever was the one's re result which were appropriate for the direction we went. The fact that going down the path we didn't take produced an R, well, those values just fall off the belt. Nobody cares. So I think I understand. I think what you're saying is it's a machine not explicitly designed to handle transactional memory. You have a different mechanism. Is that right? Again, please. It's, it's not a transactional memory machine. You have a different mechanism with the NAR bit. Is that fair? Well... <sighs> 
I will admit my biases with respect to transactional memory. To begin with, anyone who has done databases, and I have written an object-oriented database, knows that what is called transactional memory has got nothing to do with transactions. Transactions involving uh, making sure that a database in New York, Dresden, and Sao Paulo are all consistent with each other, despite the fact the network is dropping continuously at um, 100,000 transaction rates. That's transactions, and you go to Oracle to find out what a real transaction is. What is called transactional memory is actually optimistic concurrency. Rather than lock, you attempt to perform an operation, discover that you got a collision, and unwind if necessary. So I have a terminological quibble. The mill does not have any read, read modify, write operations. There's no test and set operation inherently in the hardware. There's good reasons for this, because these operations thoroughly muck up your memory channels. Instead, we have native uh, optimistic concurrency primitives. The, our primitives are rather similar to the primitives that both Intel and IBM have, which are also optimistic primitive, uh, optimistic concurrency primitives. Um, and uh, all three make use of the top level uh, data cache as a way of say, saving the read and write sets. And ours is, you don't need to know how we're different because it doesn't really matter. Uh, but fundamentally, they're basically use the same mechanism. The original work to use that mechanism was uh, I don't think I can remember the name of the paper. It was like 1985 they did it, and, and um, pretty much everybody's decided this is a good idea. And frankly, I don't expect to see read, modify, write primitives introduced in any new architecture, although obviously for legacy reasons they have to be kept in old architectures. Yes? members that are implemented differently with different size fields and different length belts and so forth. Are there other aspects of the architecture that might change from implementation? Word width, address space, uh, the size of the scratch pad register. Size of scratch pad is member dependent. Um, the data widths are not member dependent. I mean, byte, half word, word, double, and quad. We support quad. Um, um, uh, address space, um, you have a 60-bit address space, um, which is global and shared. The caches are in virtual. See the memory talk to understand how, what the consequences of that are. Um, other things that are different, functional unit population, the height of a vector, that is the, the number of element, uh, bytes in a, in a standard vector size. Um, Low end, the, the, the vector size is, is 8 bytes, and, and, uh, which is the largest scalar. Um, um, many, many other things. The, whether you have a, um, a split IND cache, that is, or your hardware, uh, Harvard architecture, or the concurrent, and other things having to do with the configuration of the cache structure, what is the length of a cache line, these things are all member dependent. And they're all done by specification. A, a single member will be two pages of specification, and then once, <clears throat> once our configuration software gets a hold of it, that turns into a whole lot of stuff, but the spec is, is straightforward. It's interesting you went to a register instead of x plus zero to move something down the belt. Again? Um, you, you talked about having a scratch pad for results that would otherwise fall off, but x plus zero moves things down the belt perfectly well. Yes, but you'd have to do that every time the, the value winds up going, getting to the end, you'd have to do it again, and this is chewing up slot and power. Um, we, we, we simply drop it down to the scratch pad, and you can get, go get it whenever you want it. You can use that. If it's, if you can't. You, 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 you Yep. That's one that doesn't go to the other. Also, there's a multi-argument operation that takes a whole bunch of them from wherever and promotes it to the cloud. Yep. And I assume a variation of ganging handles multi multiple outputs. 
Uh, no. Regular operations can have multiple outputs. Doesn't, doesn't, uh, ganging handles multiple inputs. Okay. Okay. So you don't, you don't, okay. Function units are not restricted to one output, even though almost all of them do. Well, uh, yes, but that is because they have to encode an output, and we don't have to encode an output. Right. We can simply drop as many as you want. Um, could you illustrate, for instance, how one would search a sorted list uh, through typical binary subdivision? I mean, there were maneuvers for reordering things to fit in cache pages to search the list hierarchically and the like. But I'm curious how that shakes out on your machine because uh, obviously, if you're searching different points in the list, branch prediction may not be of a lot of use. Or if, what I'm saying here is, is that it's dominated by branches, they're data driven, you're trying to tag tables. Okay, hold for a moment because I'm not getting that. Dave, could you repeat it for me? I think he has to ask it. Search ordered list. Searching an ordered list. Right, is a good example of what a machine gets hit by which seriously abuses the branch structure of the machine and an eye towards optimization matters. So can you talk about how your machine uh, addresses the search ordered list problem for, for uh, okay. Well, this touches on a whole lot of topics which um, have been covered in, um, elsewhere. Um, there's a whole bunch of difficulties in the ordered list. One is th that the inherent dependency involving in pointer chaining. Um, the, if, if your link list is actually in DRAM and not in cache, everybody is going to take DRAM hits and run at DRAM speed. No, no link list. It's an ordered list in a packed array. Oh, there's not a list. It's I thought you were talking about a link list. It's, 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 but it's sequentially dependent sequ loads, sequ like, like a list. Right, well, right, it's just an array of ordered tags. And you're using binary sub Oh, you're, you're, so you're, you're talking about a binary search in an array. Right. When, when you mentioned list, I thought you were talking link list. Excuse me. Okay. Um, binary search in an array, if you're looking for a scalar, you would presumably do a, a fairly classic um, uh, um, uh, binary search, and you would probably do it recursively because a mill call is, has no more cost than a branch does. Um, this this would probably would be your simplest way of expressing the problem. It would run as fast as the alternative. If, on the other hand, you you want to get the, uh, the vector logic involved, you certainly can, and this might be advantageous. Um, uh, uh, certainly, down at the very end of the search process, if 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 the if the array is much bigger than the probe size, such that you're unlikely it, when you miss that it will be in an adjacent slot, then you then the, uh, pulling up a vector at a time isn't going to help very much. But when you're down to the, so that you're close, that you know you're close to the value that you want, um, then pulling up a vector at a time would be reasonable. And then you would want to search within the vector uh, that you've just pulled up, and there are there are underlying primitives to support doing that. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Well, I sort of. Yeah. Well, multi-way branches does, even without vectors, multi-way branches solve the five adjacent elements problem. Uh, well, the trouble is that branches take scalars, so you would have to take your vector apart. And there's better ways to do it than taking the vector apart because, for example, if what you're searching in is a vector of bytes or if you want to take a vector of bytes, suddenly you've got 32 bytes of scalars and that's, you probably don't want to do that. chunks of that binary array hierarchically based on cache size so that you are searching within a cache using binary subdivision, which could then become a machine primitive. You can, which I should be able to load a vector and know promptly where I'm going to go get my next vector. And if that okay. kind of thing isn't in the primitives okay. of the machine, all, is all, it really a next generation machine? All, all sorts of such reorganization the mill runs normal code without rewrite. If it, that buys you anything on another machine, it'll buy you the same thing for us. 
Um, let's take it offline because I don't think I understand your problem. Okay. I don't want to have you launch into another two hour lecture, but I think one of your early uh, background slides said something about a factor 10 price performance improvement. What's the basis of that sort of a claim? Where do you think the 10x power was going that it's not going now? Hey. This is not our number in, in a fundamental sense. It is an architecturally derived number by comparison with the, between existing chips. If you look at what the power performance and price for that matter numbers are, that for the DSPs that are used for um, signal processing versus the power performance and price for that matter of the x86 chips that are used for general purpose. These cluster, <clears throat> and there is roughly a factor of 10 difference between them. Internally, we work like a DSP. Our power usage is like a DSP. Um, the things we have to do is like a DSP. The reason why people don't buy DSPs to do general purpose load, there are a few technical gotchas which a conventional VLIW um, falls into that an out of the, all of that work that an out of order does is to get you out of. We've used a different uh, mechanism, so we are able to run like an out of order, but to be internally structured and to have the power load of a DSP. Consequently, we're not measuring our chips. We don't have chips. We're simply saying, we work like that. That's the numbers they get. We'll get those numbers. The group of mechanisms to make a DSP work for general purpose. Well, there are a few novelties in the mill architecture you may have noticed. Anybody over here? <laughs> you got it. I'm happy. I mean, any pound parrot loves to yak about his baby. Ask away. <laughs> so for your widest machine with a 32-wide belt, each belt element, I assume, is a 64-bit scalar. No, it's an, it's an operant. Uh, okay. So can you talk just generally about the distribution of your widest machine of functional units? Like how many floating point units would you have, integer units? What's their market? If you're doing a, 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 um, a high performance computing, you probably got lots of FPUs. But, but if we want to do a comparison, as John asked, for your claim of a 10x advantage, we need some one specific machine to do an evaluation against. For the equivalent capability. Now, granted, I, an, uh, an x86 cannot get up that wide, it can't. But if you cut the mill down to the point where we're roughly matching the, func the functional capacity of, say, a Haswell then we'll have, what is it, one, one floating point unit, one floating point multiplier, and a, a vector unit, and two address units, and something like that that's in a Haswell. If you put that same amount of functional capacity in a mill, this would be a sort of low mid-range mill, something like one of our silver uh, architectures. Then you look at how many rename registers that Haswell has. It's got almost 500 rename registers and the data pass to feed it. Mill doesn't do that at all. It doesn't have the power, it doesn't have the leakage, it doesn't have the area, it doesn't have the wires. And similarly, the amount of, uh, it's got 300 odd read-write buffers for access to memory. We don't do any of that. We don't have to. It's a matter of just throwing things out. And when you've thrown it all out, you're down to something that looks like a DSP with a lot of functional units, which is fundamentally what we are at the power level. But when you have a large number of, say, floating point units, yeah. and if you look at the, the high-end Dion 5s or whatever, they're going to be able to do things like, uh, for example, uh, return 32 floating point uh, multiplies per no, now you're talking about a GPU. Oh, no, no. Okay, it's we are. Hmm? It's a wide, wide Cindy. Wide Cindy, okay. Um, it, it seems to me that that's going to dominate the market for the of course. Between the floating point units and the caches that are there, you have the same. The floating point is a floating point. The difference you have in the rest of the logic is going to be very small. 
So yes, well, I'm so what, I, what I'm comparing against here is general purpose code. We are a general purpose processor. The thing which is running in your laptop is what I'm comparing against. I, if, if, what you, if what you have is a specialized application in which 32 floating point units is appropriate, you probably don't want a mill. You want a GPU or something in the, similar to that. We do not attempt to compete in that market. We, yeah, we can do decent software graphics, but we're not in any stretch of, the, uh, uh, of imagination a GPU because we are not oriented toward that, the kinds of things they can do. As thrust is single thread performance at extremely low power. General purpose. Sure, but a general purpose laptop will soon have a Cindy with the 500 to 1,000 bits fly. That's not on your life. That's bits, oh. not floating point units. Well, but even if it does, that Cindy unit is used only for the graphics. Only for the okay, but, but, but so it, Haswell has an ABX2 unit, which is 256. Okay. It's got a vector unit if it's a 1024 bits and it's 32 bits each. Okay? So we're looking at 32 multiply adders. Yes? Okay. Well, I'm perfectly happy to give you a mill with a vector size which is 1024 bits and we'll have 32 multiply adders. They're not separate functional units. That's one vector unit. A separate FPU is doing another one of those right alongside it. I'm talking MIMD here, not SIMD. The mill is MIMD in one dimension and SIMD in the other, and they're individually configurable. So when I say more than one floating point unit, they're not working off a vector. They're working off of different scalars or different vectors, as the case may be. For a given amount of compute, we will have the power load of a, a, a DSP with roughly the same amount of compute. And that is vastly less than what a, a, an out-of-order machine has. Chinese? <laughs> Thank you, folks. <laughs>